Uh, old friend from uh, grad school. He got his PhD from UC Berkeley with Martin Wainwright and uh, also at MIT with Devabra Shah. And he has been a professor in the statistics department at Yale uh, for the past few years. And he's going to tell us about uh, rankings. I want to say rankings. Yes, rankings. So he's visiting us for the next three months. Oh, yes. Right. He's, spending, he's spending three months here. So if anybody wants to talk to him, you can find him. Alright, so thanks guys for the invitation to be here, and thanks Alex for the introduction, and I guess thank you guys for braving the tornado <laughs> to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some broad statistical problems that I've been interested in that deal with rank aggregation, and primarily actually focused on sort of learning preferences from people. And this is, so this is joint work with a graduate student at Yale, Yu Lu, and then uh, Su Wung Go who's at UIUC in the, in the operations research and Deborah Rothschild at MIT in the Geeks department. So we'll talk about two separate problems. The first one is what do you do when you observe, say, partial orderings? In our case, we'll just focus on pairwise comparisons. So you observe pairwise comparisons, and your goal is to put them, is to learn the preferences that, say, the overall population has for each of the items. And we want to establish, have a simple algorithm and then establish sort of statistical guarantees on recovering those preferences and hopefully show that they're optimal. And then the second problem is what if we want to start taking into consideration the individual user's preferences? So the first problem I talked about is basically a single rank aggregation or single ref preference recovery. The second problem is sort of multiple preference recovery. So say I have. So yeah, so say I have a bunch of users, and I observe sort of partial orderings from them. For example, then I go to a store, and then I buy one object over another. Uh, did it die? Are you on battery? No, no, it's plugged in. So you have a screensaver? Typically, if you have a screensaver, you turn off the screen. Usually the screensaver dies when I do this. Yeah, this is electronic. Okay, now you're there. Ooh, that's nice. What happened to the talk? <laughs> uh, you're probably just uh, oh, you have mirror, mirror, mirror display. You have not mirror, mirror display. No, no, no. It's how I wanted it. It's okay. easier. Well, we are happy to talk about that. All right. So this <laughs> is El Capitan. Have you tried it? I have not. I snow. I uh, went snowboarding down El Capitan. <laughs> Riadoso? Oh, I should do that. Okay, so we all have a preference for El Capitan over this. <laughs> <laughs> and snowboarding from El Capitan. So, the second one is so you have some users, you have different users that are sort of picking things. So, you have a guy that goes into Walmart, he's given a ton of different options, and you know that, say, he buys Kellogg's over all the other types of cereals. You know, he buys this brand of toothpaste instead of all the other ones. Etc. And you want to somehow leverage that information to infer what his preferences are across all of the different items. So you can maybe adjust what your stocks should be at, at the at the store or sell some advertisements. Okay, it's lots of big data about selling ads. All right. So primarily, what, we, what do we want to talk about first? Is statistical estimation. So in typical statistical estimation problems, we have some given data, say like some features, xi, and some examples, yi. And they're drawn from some unknown distribution, so there's tons of different examples. And we assume, say so we'll assume some underlying model that's driving this data. And the model is indexed by some parameter theta that comes from some parameter set, big theta. And then our goal is to estimate theta star from this data. And so we kind of have like, so this is xi is features, results, in a function, the output. And so there are a lot of different problems. So complex optimization methods are very popular. Lots of work. Spectral methods are very popular for different classes of problems, say like page rank and spectral clustering. So here, like, how are x and y different? What do you mean? Like, oh, OK. So here, the way x and y are different than ranking? Or right, just like, 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 like you just have some data from some thing, you want to estimate that what distribution they're in. Yeah, so in this context, what we're assuming is I have some xi, and say I want to build a model that in the future, when I observe an xi, I want to predict the yi. 
So why are labels? <coughs> why are labels? Yeah, yeah, it seems yeah. different from trying to estimate theta star. Ah, uh, yeah. So now when we want to estimate theta star, that's like wanting to understand the actual sort of underlying structure of the problem. So we want to maybe do some model interpretability or understand specifically the preferences. So not just make a prediction. So not just suppose I give two items and I want to predict which item the user will buy, but more looking at all the items, know like beforehand what are the preferences that users have for each item. So these are two different problems that you might want to solve. Uh, the prediction problem is easier, usually easier, than the inference, inference problem. Okay. So in this why I scalar, but we want to think about well, what about what if you have different other structures of y, for example, partial or partial orderings. So the rate aggregate. Well, aggregate. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, I know why. Because I did PDF logic instead of PS tricks. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, well. So in the normal rank aggregation problem, what you have is data. That's what she said here. So pairwise comparisons of teams. And then we want to aggregate it to make some decision. So say, figure out the Premier League champion, for instance. In another context, what we had were like lists of questions that people would, that a website would ask on the Washington Post. So what is our nation's most important national priority? And then users can pick which one. So better magazines, make more money. Better magazines. But, okay, yeah. Right. <laughs> is it, do we need magazines? Everything's online. <laughs> so, and then from those comparisons, we want a sort of scored ranking of the user's preferences. So not just a ranking, but we would like some sort of understand some level of intensity for each of the each of the preferences. So now, in some sense, like this problem would be easy if I could say, okay, on a score of one to ten, which one, like how important is this one thing? Then people, if they had a consistent sense would say, oh, this is a 9, this is an 8, and then you would just average it. But sometimes that's difficult to get from people. Getting a sort of, sort of unbiased estimates of an underlying score for an object across different people is very hard. Whereas people are much better at assessing sort of relative differences between, between two things. So now, the collaborative sort of preference learning problem is a little bit more general. Here, we have some users, and I observe, say, pairwise comparisons. So I could also generalize this to one out of L. So instead of asking questions like, is one better than two, I would ask questions like, here are L objects, which one, which one do you want to pick? Or here are L objects, provide a partial ordering of some of those objects. So <coughs> randomly go through and select them. And then the goal here is to infer each user's score. So here we inferred a global score across all users. Here we want to infer a score for each user, for the specific items themselves. And so the reason we're considering, again, this comparisons data is that it kind of is, is a little bit more natural. If you're Google, you won't ask someone to rank, to rate a website from 1 to 10. Or I guess they're kind of doing that now. But what you do know is when a user puts in a query, you know what <coughs> websites they clicked on. They were given, say, they saw, they looked at the top five, and they picked a couple. And so you know those were the ones preferred. And so using that data, you want to understand which websites are better. So in that sense, these comparisons data are a little bit more natural and a little bit more, uh, more unbiased. So in that sense, like, a little bit more reliable than just a pure numeric score. So the problem with this is like comparison data is nice. The problem is that aggregation itself is hard. So even just single rank aggregation is hard. And depending on how you observe your pairs, there's, you can get sort of wildly different answers based on how you aggregate. So one popular example I like is the FIFA, FIFA World Rankings where there's many inconsistencies in the, in the sense that I could look at two teams that are sort of one team that's much higher than another in the ranking, but would always lose to the team below just because the team below tends to play against stronger opponents and has more losses. Whereas the team above is weaker, but appears strong because they win more often because of their, their confidence. Okay, 
I'm in Texas, so college football is, is, a, is, a, is popular here. So college football rankings at the end of the season to decide who are the top teams that should play uh, in the Bulls is, there's, a, there's always debate. ESPN makes money out of debating this for weeks on it. Or every, every week they release rankings that are then debated. And in that case, like, there's been debates to introduce a playoff system because playoffs help denoise a little bit because you can, in some sense, actively start making decisions. So now, single aggregation is hard. And then on top of that, now we want to do sort of aggregation across users, have individual preferences per user. And this is, I guess, in contrast to just averaging numbers. If everybody could give me consistent ratings, then I just average, and it's easy. Or in the collaborative ranking sense, I could do standard sort of matrix completion. All right, so the outline here is we're going to go through the single rank aggregation problem and then talk about the personalized rank aggregation setting. So the single rank aggregation problem, you can effectively just model it as some type of directed graph. So I have an item by item matrix, and I observe outcomes. So plus one if item i beats j. And then I can encode that into a directed graph. So in general, when I just want to observe random comparisons, so that's what we're assuming. We're assuming users kind of just did the comparisons on their own. I couldn't ask the user to compare two items. They just gave me comparisons. And on top of that, so we have a graph with n choose two potential edges. And ideally, I'd like to observe edges across all the nodes. Or at least some smart selection of the edges so that I could figure out a consistent ranking. But in some sense, without doing it adaptively, well, doing it randomly makes it much harder. And so, and what we want to do is not require all n choose two edges. We'd like to do something sublinear in n choose two edges and still get reasonable results for the preferences of each of the of each of the nodes of each of the items. All right. So one super good, I mean, decent approach that there are a lot of heuristics for solving is just the Kamini optimal algorithm. All right. So what is this? We assume that a i j is the number of times that j, uh, that i beat j, right? And what we want to do, or actually, sorry, the fraction of times that i beat j, and what we want to do is find the permutation that minimizes those inconsistencies. So if i is preferred to j more often, we don't want j to be higher in the, in the ranking. Or sorry, a i j is the fraction of times that j beats i, and then small numbers mean strong. So this is a hard optimizer. Yeah, first question. Um, AIJ is uh, the number of times I beat J divided by the number of times I and J play each other. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but what if I just want to have the number of times that I beat J and not have this division? Oh, if you want the number, then then you're putting bias on people that can play a lot of games. You're, you're putting too much sort of uh, heavy weight on them. So you can have these these players. So if I'm a team player that's or a team that's weak and I end up start playing lots and lots of games and I, say, play against weaker opponents, I, you start putting more emphasis on me. Now, it's a fair one. It's a fair one because if you look, consider a randomized distribution over comparisons, and I do just play more often, and you're interested in making sure prediction error is well-behaved, then if I'm the guy that's playing against everything, you do want to put a bias on me in the estimate. You want to be more consistent with, with my choice. But we're kind of interested in the, in the preferences, and we'll see that these type of biases hurt, hurt the algorithm. So here, you're not looking for the best choice, you're looking for like, on average over everybody, they're close. Well, so in, in this context, it, in this sense, it is the best choice. We want to optimize this. So like, like if I, if I, I mean, Amazon, I got to recommend things to you. Yeah. And, I, and I'm Google, I care about who, what my top three choices are. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And somebody I see. only played once and knows one, then you're going to put them on the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, so here, I mean, we're interested in the full-on ranking, whereas Amazon or Google isn't interested in knowing Consistently, consistently with the bottom, they just care about the top five. So, so, if it was instead of the idea, if it was an idea, would that be an easy problem to solve, or would that still be a hard problem? No, the computation. That's still hard. Still hard. Yeah. What is it? 
Let me make the same question. Mm -hmm. is, uh, what is the final? Th this is just a means to an end, right? Yeah. Or is, yeah. It, or is it that I care about this objective? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, oh, okay. So, maybe I can add one more to the same. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And is there a ground root of uh, there's a unique strong order? Yeah, so, we, were, so okay. we can consider this model where I, have, I, I sort my people, and the probability of a weak opponent beating a strong opponent is P. Then this is the MLE. Makes sense. Okay, so that is the ground root model. That there is a total order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a ground truth. There is, and then this is the MLE of that. So, so tell me, I, I don't know if I understood this correctly, but uh, out of the observations I have, I have seen a bunch of comparisons. Yeah. And now you say, take uh, if there is a, a total order that is consistent with all of them, output that. Otherwise, find one to violate it and output that. Otherwise, find two to violate them and output that. Is that what she's doing? No, no, so there might be inconsistencies because there's noise. Right, so I'm saying, I'm saying, so I'm saying if there was zero inconsistencies, I would output yeah. the yeah, yeah, single. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but if there was, so then I keep finding the smallest number of inconsistencies. Relative to this strength. If they yeah, all play so the yeah. same number of times, then this would be the list of that. Just rearrange the edges based on how many times they play. Just mm -hmm. the fraction. But this is a mechanism. This is what she says. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. And why should we care about the MLA, I guess? Uh, because it's because of what Ron since you talked about. Because it's Gaussian. No, but that's a good point. So this is computationally <laughs> hard. Because <laughs> right, it's Gaussian. Yeah. <laughs> <So, laughs> <it's laughs> so this is computationally hard, so people talk about easier methods. So this is a super easy method, just the board account. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the board account assigns a score to each item that's essentially related to the fraction of times that item wins. You're just looking at the average number of times that person won. Right. So, so this is natural, for example, in the NBA. Every team roughly plays against every other team. If you're in the conference, you play four times, outside two. So you just sort people based on wins. And that's it, it, exactly what this is doing. But now there's a renormalization by how many times somebody plays. So basically, the score is the fraction of times you won. That's the board account. Except fraction of times you won. Except for like if you would play twice, maybe you play four times or some difference, right? So it's it's averaging the, the fraction. So there's there's... But like if I if I like win against two of my two games and then I lose all four of the four games, then it's still like a half even though I've lost more than one, right? Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So sorry, real quick, this is the for those that you don't know, this is the neighborhood set of I. So it's the set of all people that I has has played. Is it the AJ because AJ won? Yeah, yeah. So actually okay. you know what? I take it back. In this this is the number of times. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, okay. sorry. This oh, okay. is the number of times. Okay. That, uh, so then it's biased. Huh? So then it is biased. <laughs> it is biased. It is biased. Uh, so you I, could I also do normal. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So the key thing about this one, though, is that it's it's super computationally easy, and as long as you have random samples on the order of n, n squared, then it's it's fine. It's, it's the mode or something I'm, I'm still lost a little bit here. This is this a good, yeah, why is this good? I mean, I no, yeah, I'm arguing arguing with that. Team which plays with everybody, yeah. and nobody else plays, and this will give that person a huge score, even if they lose to everybody. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, that's sort of the, the argument about this one. That if there's a guy that only plays against weak opponents, so if you're in a conference that's weak, then they always try to think about this in college football. If you're in a weak conference, they bias your wins far less than if, if you're in a strong conference. Now, of course, there's always argument about weak and strong conferences because there's rarely crosstalk between them. But so here, I have a middle guy, never plays the strong guys, always plays the weak guys, so he'll look much stronger than he actually is. In fact, even worse, the weakest person could have the highest score because the weakest person could, everybody wants to play with the weakest person. Mm -hmm. This person wins a little bit, once in a while, one and a half. So these, but they play with n, so it's an order n score. No, 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 no. Exactly. That's why the card there. Okay, that's not okay. Okay. Right. But yeah, it's an important point. So that was the motivation for us. And then, then there's like a simple fix. 
here, all wins are weighted equally. So instead, weight the wins based on the score of the team that you play against. The patron. Yeah. So this is then basically weighted patron. It's a weighted version of patron. Okay. Although, for some reason, initially we looked at it as like message passing. And then, uh, oh wait, no, it's patron. It's double work. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a weighted version of page rank. And so, in that case, yeah. Then if you just add that as the index chain, then it really does better stand complexity. Sorry? Ah, uh, okay, so that, that's a good question. So he was asking about the computational complexity? No, it's just, uh, if, we do, if we don't have SJ, then we, the sample complexity is n squared. Yeah, so the number of samples you need is, is, is like n squared. Yeah, then if we have SJ, and then if you have SJ, yeah, so that's what we're going to argue later on. Right. So this is some algorithm. So there are a wide class of spectral algorithms that people <laughs> consider. Actually, weirdly, ours is a slight is a is, is different than the ten other ones that are out there. Um, but then there's the board accounts, and then, so there's a lot of different ways. There's also just uh, MNL model which is an exponential family, which we'll talk about later. But the point is, from all of them, you want to go direct to graph, method, a scored, a, a score, or, or a rank. And so we want to then prove what is the sample complexity of our method, of this, of this uh, rank centrality. So the algorithm, whoa, yeah, OK, I really shouldn't have done this in PDF latte. I thought it was fine. Huh? Okay, so the algorithm is simple. If you're at a node, it's just it's exactly page rank. So first, some notation. We let D max be the maximum number of competitions that any team has played. <coughs> and then so from there, if you're at your at node I, you pick one of your neighbors, basically at random, or more like one over D max. And then you jump to that neighbor with probability proportional to the number of times that neighbor is B. Right? And then you jump, loop back to yourself to normalize things. And then this yields a unique stationary distribution, S. And that S, are your, that S is your scores. So those are your scores. Now the key point here is that, well, just like in PageRank, the random walk spends more time on the stronger notes and stronger in terms of people that win a lot and play against other strong strong notes and that's where the sort of the weights are from. and then you can show through some calculations that this si is exact this si from this random walk is exactly the same si from here from this migration so they look different but they're exactly the same all right, so we tried this on some cricket data just to be, I guess, funny because that's wrong on cricket. And we looked at sort of that true rank, well, the official rankings, which Devarod says are, are, are pretty decent. And we looked at two different types of rank centrality, an unregularized version and a, and a regularized version. So in the regularized version of rank centrality, to each of the AIJs, or those are the number of times that J beats I, we add an epsilon. So this is like adding a prior distribution on the wins. So this, this was sponsored by the Australian Cricket Association? The Australian? <laughs> Aren't they the best ones? Or am I? That's the unregularized version. Yeah. The regularized version. Oh. Was sponsored by somebody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's sponsored to find the ranking or anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so but I, I'm having a hard time. Which one of the, which column should right, I so this is the unregularized. This is the unregularized one. So it still kind of gives you decent results for the top five, but the regularization sort of, it helps you out. But you still get weird inconsistencies in the middle. Mm -hmm. but, so the interesting thing is that you have a team like England that really does play more often because it's good, and they go, and they go further, and they play against stronger opponents. So they're going to kind of get screwed up, even by the, by the rank centrality. Because rank centrality will put a, an even stronger emphasis on teams that only play against stronger opponents, and England might play against, I don't know, Canada. For example, where Canada is 16th for every, for every ranking. 
<laughs> so there is some, so we are analyzing the unregularized version, but there is a benefit to consider regularizing. And that it's more similar to the ODI rating, which you hopefully believe. Uh, more like it, it smooths things out. It's doing some posterior averaging because of the prior distribution. So, uh, just go back to this yeah. <laughs> So, uh, what is the statement here? That if there is a true ranking, then SI will be converted uh, to true ranking. So, right so now there's, there's no statement. statement. There's no so, statement. Uh, this is just an algorithm, mm -hmm. and then we want to make a statement. All right. So this comes to the analysis. So what is the analysis that we're interested in? Sorry, one more question. Yep. So is your a pure random walk or like a non-backtracking walk? Once I go from IBJ, I don't come back. No, 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 it's, it's pure random walk. Pure random walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I could always jump back. Now, so the analysis that we want to consider is going to be one of a, a finite sample analysis. So oftentimes in statistics, we might think about asymptotics. But asymptotic analysis in this context is not useful because I'm interested in a finite set of sort of n different items, and I want to understand exactly what is the order, or how does the error behave when I observe a sublinear and n squared number of examples. So that's what we want to understand the finite, like in the finite setting for all n and examples m, what is the error behavior, and in what model. So we know if I have an active noiseless sort of setting, I'm going to roughly need, I'm going to need n log n comparisons. So this is active, meaning I can adaptively pick comparisons, and it's noiseless, meaning comparisons are set. And the oracle knows that there is an ordering, the oracle knows it and gives me a right, the right answer. But we have noisy and random observations. So we're going to impose some type of model on rankings to deal with the, to understand the noise. So one, there's a ton of models that people consider in, in economics, sociology, psychology, computer science. So you have the rational view, there's a sort of a consistent ranking that I can find given the data and people make their decisions rationally. That's sort of not likely given our, our problem. So we take, and I'm going to stats from an, I take a probabilistic view. And so we don't look at full-on general models. We are going to look at specific parametric models. And these are due to Thurston. And then there's a specific one that we look at is the MNL or Bradley Terry uh, loose model. And so this is widely, widely used. It's used by McFadden for the BART system. It's also used in the, in the chess ranking, ELO, the ELO ranking system, the updates of player scores or strengths is, uh, is, is stochastic gradient descent on the MNL model. And so for that, the model assumes there are some true underlying weights, W sub i, and the probability that J beats i is just the ratio of those weights. Or, well, Wj over Wi plus Wj. So that's it. And so we want to understand- So that's the MNL model? Th yeah, sorry, this is the MNL model. This is, this is the MNL model. And then if, and again, if you, if you know, the ELO rank chess ranking system. Uh, whenever somebody beats somebody else, the update to their score is basically a stochastic gradient descent on this. But there with problems.
So in this context, we have the following once I pick the estimator, that error is lower bounded by this one. So up to this log, it's tight. And so the key point is, Just recovering the scores themselves. Was this consistent or anything? So what I'm assuming is that as as something uh, you want with high probability that you can sort them correctly. Because yeah. if you're a little above or a little below, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If you're looking at those two. Yeah, exactly. How strong is the dependence on theta? On the other like W min and W max? Yeah, so that's strong. So that's, that's, that's quadratic. That yeah, so that's quadratic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the idea there is if you, if it, if you if I play against a grandmaster in chess, I'm going to get crushed in five moves. Uh, we wouldn't play against each other, hopefully. Uh, I can immediately know that he's he's better than these people and, and would cut it out. But that actually for for us and there have been a couple of other follow-up papers to this. When you want to recover the parameters, this is is kind of an annoyance. Now, if you're only interested in prediction error, you can kind of drop this, but then you get slower. So, so what if slower. you like only play people, like your choice of who you play is randomly people within some constant fraction in the W's? Because right? ah, ah. I, I choose my rating in chess, I play people within 100 points of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's an interesting.
there's been a lot, a couple of follow-up papers, one by guys at UIUC and then also at, at Berkeley, where they analyze the the Emily. We in our paper we also analyze the Emily, and the at least the the performance is similar to rank centrality. But we found computationally, granted, I, we didn't try to optimize this, but computationally, running rank centrality is easier. Rank centrality, I just use I I guess the. The MLE, I run logistic regression, so I use uh, R and Python packages, and I guess seems to be faster. So the other thing is, PageRank is like is power iteration, and yeah. you can do power iteration as a gradient descent. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering if if there is a connection between uh, between the maximum likelihood solvers and, and your solver being some sort of a gradient descent. Yeah. So I think there's a connection between our solver and a second order maximum likelihood. is terrible. And in this case, what can happen is I can have the weakest opponent just play against everybody. And in this case, again, it makes it hard to get a good estimate of, of the parameters. Alright, so with that, we also ran some experiments to compare the spectral method that we're talking about to the other spectral methods and to MLE and to the board account. So the first one we looked at is this Washington Post data set where we observed pairwise comparisons. And so the Washington Post data set actually had a lot of data. So you actually could get a complete graph. So what we did is we sparsified that graph to compare, to compare methods. So maybe that's not fair, but we wanted to understand by using the full data as a, as a kind of ground truth. So in that case, here we're actually looking at the di L1 distance, because comparing to L1, right, the L1 distance of our permutation to the estimated, to the true permutation that we found by looking at all the data. And then as you, so as you increase the sampling rate, of course, both rank centrality and L1 rank gain start improving, and rank centrality t tends to beat the L1 rank gain by like a couple. So the next one is when we specifically looked at a synthetic BTL model where we're varying K. So this is we're given a fixed graph. I can't observe any extra pairs, but I vary K. So the amount of times that I subsample each comparison. And so what's interesting here is when you look at the L1 ranking, as I increase K, it, it, it starts to, it actually flattens out. That's because of this whole randomness and weak opponents playing against only weak guys. Whereas both rank centrality and the ML estimate, they go to zero and are roughly stacked on top of each other. So what that would say is that even if I <clears throat> had no randomness and gave you the exact uh, PIJs, yeah. the, uh, L1 and... Would not be consistent not in be terms cons of recovering Ws. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, sorry. This is, this is our, the, the error we use. We're comparing the strengths and then looking at if, it's, if it was an incorrect classification to kind of be fair. Because to be fair, L1 ranking isn't optimizing what we're optimizing, trying to find the scores. It's just finding some, some estimates. So we, the error here that we look at is with respect to the ranking output. And if that ranking is inconsistent, then the penalty we pay is the difference of the weights. So if two weights are close and we make an error, it's fine. The far we pay a big price. Okay. 
but if we had the exact Ws, yeah. then the error would be zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so the fact that they don't get the yeah. means that they are not going to get it. Right. Yeah. But, but also that takes care of the problem of having a massive W, because you don't need to estimate that. You just need to know that he's the best. Yeah, and that's true. It doesn't appear in that. Uh, yeah, in this, yeah. It, it, it doesn't appear. Huh? True massive W is one of which is more massive than the other. Then you want a huge penalty. That's right. That's true. So then we can also look at varying D over N. So our D over N is the sampling rate of the edges. So D is the expected degree of any node. And in that case, again, as we go to a complete graph, everything well. behaves well, but both the MLE and rank centrality are basically stacked on, stacked on top of each other uh, in this model. So the last one to consider is the same sort of experiment, BTL model varying K. We still have the board account here, but we're also looking at some other Markov chain type of models that were really looked at in, uh, in, in work by Cynthia Dwarak where they were not analyzing the Markov chain, but arguing to use the Markov chain methods as an initial, initial step to a greedy heuristic for that Kemeny optimal solution. So they have a lot of different Markov chain methods in their paper, so we're comparing theirs. So, so the Kemeny is, we decided, is not uh, the max likelihood, because it's about because it's... No, no, so, so the Kemeny is the maximum likelihood if I just consider the product distribution. And I, if I fix the pairs that are being compared, so I'm in a fixed design setting, and they're independently compared against each other with probability p, then the Kemeny is. Because if I have paired, or if I have a node that is compared a lot. So that's what gets out of it. Is. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's how you solve in, it. In that sense, yeah, in that case. So in, in this sense, so rank centrality still does quite well in this, in this error. And then the other workup chain methods kind of, uh, kind of behave weirdly. So, apparently, ranks them shallow. So, do they consider a different error on which the other markup chain work well? So, they're considering that Kemeny error. So, for us, we're comparing it just to this error. Uh -huh. So, this, we're also biasing, or we're saying that, okay, I'm willing to make <coughs> mistakes as long as the weights were close to each other. And why is this error better than this? Like, oh, because it, it, Well, why are heavier weight edges worth more? Ah, because if I'm making mistakes on heavier weight on nodes or yeah, heavier weight edges, then I should pay a bigger price. Whereas if two things are roughly the same and I flip them, I shouldn't care as much. But if I have two parts of my graph and one of which has twice the weights as the other, yeah, then like like the chance between the two things that are have twice the weights is still like two thirds one third as these, but you're penalizing it more because your weights are an absolute value larger. Wait, no, 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 but the weights, it's in terms of those differences, but... Right, but the but like... So this, you can almost think of this as a prediction error. So this is essentially saying that I'm penalizing but, you but for predicting... But it's penalized by the sum, right? Like your chance of winning is wi over wi plus wj. Yeah, yeah. And so if you double the weight in half your graph, uh -huh. then this penalty, that half will like be worth more. Yeah. Even though the like, prediction oh. error is the same. Amongst, Amongst themselves. themselves. Amongst themselves. That's but right. not... I see. So you're saying that, oh, this is now just 2x for that half. I've doubled yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Right. Um, so the denominator be w squared. Uh, yes. Yeah. So this, so the reason we also look at this error is it ends up being upper bounded by the error that we found. Yeah. The, it should be w squared. OK. So that's the single rank aggregation, which I guess, how much time is there? Well, um, they have 15 minutes. So we started 15 minutes ago, so that's definitely fair. Oh, yeah. So there was a lot of fun with the single rank aggregation, and now we'll go to the personalized rank aggregation problem. Which, by the way, is your paper on this online? Yeah, it's an ICM. Oh, okay. I don't know. It's not on your website. Oh, my website is there. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's, it's on, it's on like, I see one right now. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, my bad. I should have been more careful. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so let's just recap now the individualized rank aggregation problem. Whereas before I ignored the user's response, <laughs> now I'm actually going to keep track of the user and what response that they gave. And then again, the goal is to infer the underlying preferences. And so, just to remind everyone of the standard collaborative filtering problem, 
I have users, and they give me ratings. There's a lot of unobserved ratings, and I want to infer things that they might like, make recommendations of books or items or movies that the user would be interested in. Now, this is all based on, say, like in Netflix, Netflix actually asks you to rate. What we're suggesting is don't ask people to rate. Just look at when Netflix gave them some answers, the movies that they decided to watch of the movies that are available. So in standard collaborative filtering, the model is we have some unknown matrix theta star. And then given data, ij theta star ij, so this can be noisy. i is the user, j is an item, and I observe a noisy rating. I want to estimate theta star. So in that sense, you can think of it as I want to estimate the preferences that users have for different objects. Now this is inconsistent, this is sort of ill-specified because if I have no model on the matrix or no assumption, I could fill it in with anything, and that's fine. So obviously one model would be to just fill up the average. For everything that's unobserved, just compute the average, and then that's what you would do. And that's what most people did, and then Netflix said, no, we could do better, let's do collaborative filtering. And then you make it more personalized. But that assumes a model. So here are two typical models. One is a mixture model. So the mixture model is the following. You assume that there are R prototypical types of users. So say people that are interested in horror movies, people that are interested in action movies, people that are 80% of the time interested in horror movies and 20% of the time interested in comedies. And so we have R prototypical types of users. And we're assuming everybody can be only one of them. So that's a stringent assumption, but that's just the mixture model. So you could generalize that to people are fractions of them, but for now, just every user can be one of those. And so our matrix is just copied versions of these bars. So here are two, and we just have blue and green bars. Right now, a slightly more general model is the low rank matrix model. In this case, we're assuming that there's some unknown embedding of users and movies such that the rating of a user for a particular movie is just the inner product. And so this model captures this, but in more generality, because I'm no longer saying that this matrix, I'm sorry, this matrix needs to be sparse. So that's the transpose. So I'm allowing lots of basically lots of different mixtures of prototypical users. The low rank matrix model plus. So one interesting point about standard matrix completion then is that if I look at it as users rating movies, I can also look at it as move, movies rating users. It's symmetric. But now in the, in the ranking context or in the revealed preferences context, I can't do that. I know a user picked movie A over B, but I don't know what a movie did. And so that kind of was, a, was an interesting observation for us because a lot of collaborative ranking, uh, collaborative filtering solutions are based on clustering movies and then just finding similar types of movies or clustering users. But I think there's some preference towards, the, towards clustering the movies. The key, the other key is that we directly observe the noisy observations. But now in an individualized rank aggregation, it's similar to standard matrix completion, but now we have, say, a D1 where I have D1 users, by D2 choose two, if I'm only looking at pairwise comparisons, matrix, and it's plus ones and minus ones, and I want to fill in the missing entries. So now in general, this is super though specified. I have just way more data to consider. I could fill in random plus ones and minus ones, but I, maybe I want them to be consistent with what I saw, but when there's no ranking or anything. So again, we want to understand how are the entries being generated. And so again, we'll look at the MNL model. So just to recap, this is our model. We assume that user I has a score J for item J. And we call that theta star ij. And then the probability that user i picks item j over item k 
is then just this. e to the theta star ij over e to the theta star ij plus e to the theta star uh, ik. Alright, so, so... You get only one observation of this, right? You are never going to get multiple ones. Because once the person sees a movie, they are never going to see it again or make this decision again. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. But in our model, we're going to assume randomness. So it, something could be rewatched, and we're going to pretend that's the user's kid watching it, or something like that. But then you're getting into mixture models, yes. like mixture and, and linear regression as well. But for now, the model will consider is that you could see pairs twice. So this is like in the matrix completion problem, where we assume that I observe IID random samples. And there are results for non-ID random samples, but the simplest analysis is when you assume <laughs> IID samples. So I could observe the same book twice and give it different ratings. So we're going to assume, assume that you can observe a pair twice. I mean, your sample complexity will essentially prevent that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So the sample complexity will, because we're working in a high dimensional regime where we're much, much less than D, D1 times D2 log the product, but still, we don't assume. And that, yeah. All right, so then the model is we take theta star to be approximately low rank. So again, that captures the mixture models in the low dimensional embeddings. Here we assume that the Frobenius norm, so the sum of the squares of the matrix is bounded by one. So that's just a normalization thing. I should also add, we assume that the sum of the rows of theta star or zero. That's for identifiability. Because here, linear off offsets, it's the same linear offsets of a row doesn't change the distribution. So we're going to assume that the sum of the theta stars is zero. And then we also assume an L infinity bound on the matrix. So this is called the spikiness condition, and it also arises in the matrix completion literature, and I should say that this problem is also connected to the one-bit matrix completion problem, or just matrix completion with GLM noise problem. And this is sort of guaranteeing that the information in the matrix is spread uniformly throughout. It's the same idea as previously, where if I have one guy that's very strong, in this context, it's unlikely that I see him even if I have one guy that's strong. Uh, it's unlikely that I make that comparison. Sorry, I should say one object that's strong for one user. So I have a, my matrix is just a single one. It's unlikely that I'll see a comparison with that single one. So then we observe n observations of the form. We see the user, we see the items, and we see an outcome. Again, we could generalize this to multiple items and then the outcome is a single thing. I picked one of the objects, or I picked multiple ones of the objects, or I saw a partial ordering of the, of the object. And then the model is just this model, but dealing with some normalization issues. So the probability of yi, I should say, given a user, and given